This morning I'm going to read from Luke chapter 5, verse 27, and I'm going to stress the importance of the Holy Spirit again in our lives. And, of course, we said a couple of weeks ago we have to pray like we've never prayed before and we have to reach out like we've never reached out before. And the second one about reaching out is something that perhaps we need to grow a little in. This is individuals, not as a group, to reach out to others, to bring them to Christ, to bring them to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to try to address that a little bit today to make us more aware of that truth. And of course, as um, I've said before, the, 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 uh, it's important that we're in agreement in the house because if we're not in agreement in what we're doing, we can't progress. The signs and wonders and the preaching is not enough for us to grow as a body. It's very important, of course, and um, I highly emphasise it, but it's not enough. We need to be in agreement going forward. So in verse 27 of chapter 5, it says, When he, this is Jesus, went out after this, he noticed a tax collector, Levi by name, sitting by the customs house, and, and said to him, Follow me. And leaving everything, he, he got up, and followed him. So he would have had a booth. He would have been probably outside the town. We're not sure which town it was, although Jesus had just left Capernaum. Um, it was one of my favourite places when we went to Israel, Capernaum. A, a lot of things happened there. For example, the man who was uh, delivered of the unclean spirit in the synagogue. It was at Capernaum. You, you go there, you can see the ruins of that synagogue. Jesus just walked into a normal service that's equated to this one where everyone's supposed to be holy and knows everything and there was a man there who obviously needed a bit of cleaning up. So um, that, that was Kafana. He did a few things and then he went around the region there. Uh, it's a great lake and parts of the region there are actually uh, were pagan uh, a lot of them were Jewish settlements. A lot of the activity of Jesus happened around Lake, Lake Galilee. And it's important to understand that Jesus now, he's starting his music, he's going around, things are happening. He's around that area. His own place, Nazareth, doesn't want too much to do with him at all where he grew up. And so he, he makes Capernaum his base and he goes around from there and he, 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 he starts to call the 12. He called the others on the, on the shores of Lake Galilee. And now he, he calls this tax collector who is kind of anathema to the, to the religious system of the day. You couldn't eat with these people. You had nothing to do with them because they were collaborators with the Romans. And they also gained money for themselves in the process. So they weren't looked on very well by the people. And here we go. Jesus calls one of these. His, his name is Matthew. He, he wrote the other, one of the other Gospels. And what happens next then horrifies the religious leaders. It horrifies them. So we go, in, our, in, in his honour, Levi held a great reception in his house and with them at table was a large gathering of tax collectors and others. That means they were on the outer as well, according to the religious system of the day. The Pharisees and their scribes complained to the disciples and said, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus said to them in reply, it is not those who are well who need a doctor, but the sick. 
I have not come to call the virtuous, but sinners to repentance. This is the word of the Lord. There's more probably to read, but we'll just start there. And we need to go back a little bit because here we have Jesus reaching out to the one. Not only is he calling him, but he's actually reaching out to the one. Now, this is the principle we want to apply in our own lives, to pray and reach out to the one, one person. So it's not impossible for us, is that on or not? Yeah. For us to reach one person in one year, And if we really, you know, when we, when we first came to the Lord, many of us, when I was baptised in the Holy Spirit, I think I brought 20 people to the Lord about that anyway. Probably give or take a few. Now, I, haven't, I can't say that every year. This is personally I'm talking about. What we really want the Lord to do in us through the Holy Spirit is to give us that desire again, to see that people need to be saved. People need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. People need eternity with God. And we may be the only people that can speak to a particular person. Now, I know that there are ways that we shouldn't do this. And that's to become heavy, to become pharisaical, to reach out to people, I'm better than you and all that. But we reach out in love. We're doing a course called Make Love Your Aim. That should help us to give us the motivation as to why we're doing it. Recently I was looking at some churches and um, I really like this church. It's a very good church and if I was in the area I'd go to it. However, the other day they were having targets for certain things. Now, there's nothing wrong with having targets for certain things. In fact, I'm giving you one today, one person for one year. But we don't want to be stuck on targets because if we get stuck on targets, we dehumanise people. And so we're concentrating on the one, the one person who's a human being and we're doing that in love, making love our aim. And our aim is then, because love is our aim, is to bring them to Christ and to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Someone who doesn't know Christ, someone who hasn't been baptised in the Holy Spirit. That's our aim. So here we have Jesus, he calls a man and he not only calls him, he brings him into his inner sanctum. He's one of the twelve. And then this Levi, Matthew, out of gratitude, he has a meal. He calls a feast, brings all his friends along, all the un unevangelized people. And he brings them along and he brings Jesus in and they have a, a, a great party. Of course, the, the religious leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees, didn't like this because they had built so many laws to protect what they had, which was precious, which is something we still benefit from today. But they became so preoccupied with that that they lost again the purpose and the reason. They lost the people in the process. They drew, they had laws about the law. So you were not supposed to mention God's name in vain. So they, they went a step further and they didn't even mention his name at all. They put another name, the Lord, instead. This is how how many, um, if you like, gates or, or things they put around. They built more and more laws. 
well-intentioned, people, Jewish people, till today, keep that practice. But that was a law made by the Pharisees. You should, we should know that. So Jesus doesn't comply with that because he goes to the party. Now, again, did Jesus comply with what he was supposed to do? Yes, he did. By and large, he obeyed all the law. He didn't go around trying to break the law. But here we have something actually that was beyond the law. And the system became more important than the people. And so Jesus, reached, Jesus goes to that uh, party and to get the scorn of the f scribes and Pharisees. Now, the problem with us today is we're afraid to evangelise because of the scorn of people. I remember one time there was a lady who was dying and Julie and I reached out to her. She had cancer. I think her daughter was a friend of our daughter. She was a, a nice woman. We tried, we befriended her. But when we asked her to pray, could, could we pray for you? She strongly said no. No. Now that was, that was hard to take. It wasn't pleasant when she said no. But it was a risk that we had to take. Unfortunately, she died a short time later. The reason we don't usually, and this is one reason I don't usually reach out, because I'm scared of the consequences when things don't go well. Because for every person you reach out to, there'll be at least one in two that will refuse your invitation. And that's one of the reasons why we don't reach out. The other reason we don't reach out in our society is because we're very busy. And so God usually gets put into the corner, whether it's to pray, whether it's to attend worship services, whether it's to read the Bible, or it's to, whether to make time for people so that we can help them know God. Those four things get crowded out in our society. That's why in some ways when we go to places like Uganda and Malta and that, it's better in this sense because people have more time for each other. And you have more time to actually explain things and talk to them. Time isn't so so um, desperate as it is in our Western society. There is time for people. When someone dies in these countries, people take time off. Now, in this country, you can hardly get a time off to go to a funeral from your employer, unless it's your mother or sister or brother or someone like that. You see, all these things work against the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we've got to be aware of them as to why we don't personally evangelise. And of course, there's another big one, is that a lot of the things we stand for today are not politically correct. So we have to be wise on how we go about things. Jesus didn't care about these things, however, because he was preoccupied with doing the will of his father. He wasn't interested primarily in what people were thinking. His only mission in life was to do and to, what his father told him and to see what his father was doing so that he can join in with it. 
And this is our, the lesson for us. If we're going to pray like we've never prayed before, if we're going to evangelise like we've never evangelised before, then we must get back in tune with God himself. And I know that some people have been doing that. There's one person who's sitting here in front of us this morning has been very sensitive to God's instruction that perhaps in the earlier part of his life he hasn't been as much. So it can be done and it can be done at any age. It can be recovered when it was done and it's not been done in recent times. So Jesus goes on and he says a few more things. I might read on a little bit. I'll have to watch the time. Then they go into a discussion about fasting, okay? And, you know, Jesus tells them the obvious, while well, the bridegroom's here, you're not, we're not going to fast, but you will fast. He also told them a parable. No one tears a piece of new cloak to put it on an old cloak. If he does, not only will we have torn the new one, but place, but, a, but the piece taken from the new will not match the old. And anyone who puts new wine into old skins, if he does, the new wine will burst. The skins will then run out and the skins will be lost. No new wine must be put into fresh skins. And nobody who has been drinking old wine wants new. The old is good, he says. Another, if you like, obstacle to us moving forward and drinking the new wine is old habits. And they, these could be old religious habits. It's interesting because usually when, when someone starts a church or starts a movement or starts a religious order, there's great enthusiasm and people follow. And usually those leaders are very prophetic people. But then what happens is after 30 and 40 years, Everything gets coded. That person dies or moves on. And people keep doing exactly what that leader was doing 40, 50, 100, 200 years ago. They haven't moved on. Now, we don't move on by changing the gospel, by the way. The gospel remains the same. The Holy Spirit remains the same. Jesus remains the same. The Bible remains the same. The Father remains the same. The gospel message remains the same. The kerygma remains the same. Nothing changes there. But there has to be cultural relevance in applying that truth. There has to be creativity in applying that truth. If we do things, if we had done things in a particular way, even in evangelising, I wouldn't recommend some of the things we used to do in the early days. <laughs> um, because uh, today they just wouldn't work. So it's very important that Kind of, we, we don't have a preconceived idea how we're going to evangelise. Okay? Because it may not be the right way to do it. We have to be open to the Holy Spirit and we have to, again, concentrate and love the one. Because if we don't do that, then we will um, lose that person very quickly. So to summarise, because we're nearly, we're nearly at the end, the key person in all of this is not me or you or the person that you're trying to evangelise, but the key person is the Holy Spirit. The key person is the Holy Spirit. He's the one you've got to go to. 
He's the one that's got, when you pray, you have to ask for help. He's the one that you've got to listen to his promptings. So he's the most important person. The next most important person is the person you're evangelising. And the least important person is yourself. We gave a talk yesterday about moving out of ourselves. If we never make that transition from self to other, we will never grow spiritually. Every one of you is here because your mother gave up nine months of her life. Death for nine months, life for you. If we're still concerned about my ministry or my time or my life or my career or how much money I'm going to make and I'm not concerned about the salvation of others, then there's a serious problem. That's it in a nutshell. And then when we realise, when I realise how selfish I am, I have to ask the Holy Spirit to help me. I have to go to the Holy Spirit and ask him to repent and to help me change because in my will alone, I cannot change. Yes, I need to exercise my will. But that's insufficient. If you know my will, it's pretty weak. Maybe you have a strong will. My, remember my father used to have a very strong will. I didn't inherit that from him. I've got a very weak will. Sometimes it's an advantage because then you may need God. You might need God more. But it's something you need to think about. So-